Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Easy Automation Solutions, Better Results. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. This webinar is actually the first presentation in a three-part series on laboratory automation solutions for smaller labs and those less familiar with automation who are interested in standardizing workflows and saving costs through improved efficiency and results. This year, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences is celebrating 30 years in automation as they continue to provide liquid handling solutions to help accelerate reliable results that drive scientific discovery. Beckman offers a full range of flexible and scalable biomech automated workstations and integrated systems to automate genomic, cellular, protein, and other work workflows in a wide variety of research areas, including agriculture, cancer and infectious diseases, cardiovascular, forensics, and neurodegenerative disorders. For genomic applications, biomech automated workstations are complemented by a growing portfolio of nucleic acid extraction and purification kits built on the company's patented solid phase reversible immobilization, SPRI, magnetic bead technology. Let's get started. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credit. You can pose questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. I now present today's speakers, David Horvath, MS, and Zach Smith, MS, who are both senior application scientists for Beckman Culture Life Sciences. David automates propriety and third-party next-generation sequencing chemistry. He has a Master's of Science in Medical and Molecular Genetics from the Indiana University School of Medicine. David's career experiences span a broad range of life science fields, including forensic DNA analysis, medical diagnostics, and agricultural biotech. Zach automates propriety and third-party next-generation sequencing kits. He has a Master's in Environmental Science from Indiana University. Previously, Zach worked at the university's Center for Genomics and Bioinformatics as a project scientist. David will now begin his presentation. Thank you, Judy, and thank you to all of our attendees. I'm glad to have you with us this morning, or I guess evening, depending on where you're at. Um, as Judy mentioned, this is part one of a three-part webinar series, and so today we'll be talking about uh, introducing <coughs> Uh, customers to, the, to automating NGS workflows. Uh, we'll continue uh, in June with uh, the second part of DNA and RNA sequencing sample prep and then go into a little more detail on specific methods uh, ranging from simple to complex. The third part of the series is entitled Mission Possible Automating NGS Sample Prep for Challenging Samples and Niche Applications. So we'll be discussing some of the applications that are uh, becoming available for niche markets and, and how we address uh, challenges of manual processing for, for those chemistries. Okay, to begin, we want to talk about what a typical NGS workflow is. And typical is in quotes for a reason because there really isn't a typical NGS workflow. In general, though, um, it follows this workflow that we have on the slide. Uh, you start with cDNA synthesis for RNA-seq uh, applications, and then continuing from there, you have your traditional library construction steps, which will include end repair, A-tailing, ligation of the adapters, uh, and, and subsequent cleanups after each of those steps. PCR enrichment is optional for certain workflows, and depending on the workflow Target capture is also an optional <coughs> part of an NGS workflow. Following the traditional library prep uh, construction, you will continue on to do library QC, quantitation, and sequencing preparation, and the actual sequencing run itself. So 
So although most NGS workflows follow this consistent path, the, the specific workflow can vary greatly for each application. They can range from single day short and simple protocols to multi day highly complex protocols. Even though the workflows can vary greatly, they all share common elements such as reagent and enzyme transfers, sample transfers, feed based sample cleanup and or size selection, as well as thermocycling and incubation reactions. So we focus on the modularity of those common elements and optimize those and then construct them in different ways to uh, basically assemble the, the workflows for each individual application. Here we have some workflow examples of uh, a simple NGS workflow for the Rubicon Genomics Thruplex Plasma Seed Chemistry. The protocol takes approximately three and a half hours to complete. It's performed in a single plate for all the reactions, and there's a limited number of start and stop points. So it's a relatively simple manual process and also a relatively simple um, application on the automation as well. The first column here, it's a little bit hard to see all the detail, but that's basically your library construction. And the second column is an optional cleanup following your library construction. The next example gets into more of, I guess, a typical workflow um, as far as complexity is concerned. And this example is for the Illumina TrueSeq Nano DNA uh, chemistry. It's approximately a one-day protocol. It involves uh, multiple reactions and cleanup plates and has multiple start, start and stop points. And to continue on to a difficult or highly complex method example, this is an example of the Illumina TrueSeq RNA access method, <clears throat> which is approximately a three-day protocol. It includes target capture following library construction or adapter ligation. And it has an increasingly larger number of labware and consumables due to the overall length of the process, and it's highly complex with numerous start and stop points. So again, all these workflows follow a series of reaction setups, um, incubations, cleanups, etc. <clears throat> it's just the length of the application and the, uh, the complexity of how those steps are, are pieced together to create the overall workflow. So if you're already processing sorry, okay, if you're already processing um, NGS samples by hand, you know the challenges of the NGS uh, workflow. <clears throat> so some of those challenges are a significant amount of manual pipetting steps. So with a significant amount of pipetting, you have higher variability, uh, especially with cleanups such as adapter cleanups or your final sample yields. Often it requires skilled pipetting. So what I mean by that is uh, transferring of viscous liquids, in-well tip mixing, or preventing magnetic bead carryover while transferring supernatant off of a plate. Um, manual pipetting steps can also contribute to user fatigue and injury. Uh, manual processing is highly error prone. Uh, some examples would be sample and or index transfer mix-ups, sample normalization errors, master mix recipe calculation errors, and pipette volume setting errors. So basically setting your pipette to the wrong volume, um, affecting reaction chemistry, um, bead ratios, et cetera, that are important for cleanup or size selection. In addition, manual processing provides limited throughput and reduced data generation. Small labs, or any lab for that matter, um, is always, they're always limited in personnel resources. How many people you have to get the work done, whether you have a small amount of work or a large amount of work, people always are the limiting factor in how much you can get done. Um, <clears throat> often, there's more effort spent on routine sample processing versus more value-adding data analysis. So automation can minimize or eliminate all of these challenges. So with that being said, Beck and Coulter would like to think that every lab <laughs> would want to automate, but we hear from customers they're not ready to automate. And here are several reasons that they give as to why they're not ready to make that jump from manual processing to automated processing. 
We are too small. Well, automation reduces the effort of routine processing and increases productivity even with limited personnel resources. So to allow your, um, your small lab with limited number of, of personnel to be able to do more work more effectively and again be able to focus on the value adding data analysis work versus routine sample processing. Labs also say that their throughput is not high enough to justify automating. Well, throughput is not the only reason for automation. So automation provides more accurate and reproducible sample data, irrespective of sample number, and is scalable to match a lab's growing needs. Some labs feel that they trust their people more than machines. <laughs> so uh, biomech applications are demonstrated and qualified with data to support robust performance. And I'll talk a little bit later about how our development process works for our applications and the types of data that we generate to support those claims and the performance of the application. Budgets. Budgets are always limited, whether you're a small lab or a large lab. So automation can provide significant savings over manual processing through reduced labor or overtime pay, reduced rework caused by human error, and reduced consumable usage via efficient lab order and tip handling. So encourage labs to look at the big picture of how automation can fit into their workflow and, and provide an overall cost savings as compared to manual processing. And lastly, uh, we don't have the expertise to operate and maintain laboratory automation. So Biomech software is full featured and easy to use, which makes it the right solution for either the novice or experienced user. Okay, so for the middle portion of the presentation, we're gonna talk about what Beckham Coulter does to develop an application. So we're going to start with market research, followed by building collaborative partnerships, um, scoping the requirements and features of the application, and then begin the development process, where we develop and optimize the method, and test the method with real reagents and generate data, and then produce content such as tech notes, application notes, posters, webinars such as this, um, <clears throat> which go through an internal and external review process. That's followed by installation of the applications at the customer site and then post-installation support. So I'll go over some details on each of those parts of our development process. To start with, um, we have market research. We're looking out into the field to see what applications are in demand and we gather that feedback from various places, whether that's trade shows, customers, um, publications, journal articles, et cetera, to see what people are doing in their research. And we utilize that to set a queue up to prioritize which applications um, we're going to focus on development. <clears throat> when we select the applications to develop, we, we want to build collaborative partnerships with the chemistry vendors and key research institutions. So they're the great partnerships. Uh, we work to ensure that the, the chemistry is being automated in, in the manner in which it was intended to be run manually. So it's, uh, working with the chemistry vendors to ensure that the, the data quality comes out automated the same as it does manually, if not better. And we partner with key research institutions, customers who are either using this chemistry already by hand or have an interest in automating this chemistry in their lab. And we use them as a, as a real world case example for processing these samples in a customer's lab. So we generate data together and ensure that through that partnership that we have a robust and reliable solution um, to go out to our broader customer base. So after those collaborations are made, the next step is to scope out the requirements and features for the particular application. The goal is to develop a template method that can be readily deployed to customers. A template method is going to be a method that covers the majority of options and workflows that we expect to see out in the field, but still be flexible enough to offer configuration for user-specific needs once it gets out into the field. We focus on things such as throughput, capacity, uh, walk-away time, we consider various accessories and integrated devices that are required to perform uh, the various workflow steps. Workflow options such as sample number, um, safe stop points, uh, any 
any type of manual interactions for phonocycling that might be needed, all those are considered <clears throat> while scoping out the method, as well as the instrument platform selection. Okay, so I'll talk about our instrument platforms. We have multiple configurations which provide flexible throughput and capability to handle any NGS workflow. The Biomech 4000 is our introductory bench shot model. It's sized just right for low to medium throughput labs. Typically, we develop applications anywhere from 1 to 24 samples on, on this instrument. While it can handle greater numbers of samples, um, it's usually limited <clears throat> to that number so that walk away capability and efficiency is still realized on that platform. It has a, a pod that has interchangeable pipetting tools, so there's single tools and eight channel pipetting heads. It also has uh, interchangeable grippers, so you can have the ability to move labware on the deck and, and not have them be fixed in uh, one spot. The deck layout below is, the, is a typical example of our NGS setup for the bottom deck 4000. It includes an orbital shaker, uh, static LTA device for keeping reagents chilled. Um, the next platform is our Biomech NXP, and that's going to be our mid-sized unit. It's capable of medium to high throughput workflows, up to 96 samples. It has various pod options. It's a single pod, which can be either a span 8 or a multi-channel pod, the multi-channel having options for either 96 or 384 wellhead. Uh, it also has the capability of enhanced multi-selective tip pipetting, which is a multi-channel head that has capability to pipette single rows, single columns, or even individual wells. So it provides some flexibility of a span system while still providing the efficiency of a multi-channel head. There's approximately 16 deck positions in a highly customizable deck, allowing an increase in capacity over the Biomech 4000. And again, an example of our typical NGS deck setup below with a static LTA in the back left corner. There's an orbital shaker in the back middle, trash chute on the right, and the two positions on the far left are stacking positions. So that increases capacity for additional tip storage or plate storage. And lastly, we move into our Biomech FXP, which is our largest platform. It's a high throughput uh, it's a fitting system for high throughput or complex workflows, up to 96 samples or more. And I should stress that the size or the, the amount of throughput you have and the size of your lab doesn't necessarily dictate the size of the instrument that would be right for you. If the workflow requirements um, <clears throat> for your particular application require a lot of cleanups and a lot of enzyme transfers, then having a dual pot system, regardless of throughput, um, or total capacity is still beneficial to your lab. So the Biomech FXP can be configured with a combination of two pods, uh, a multi-channel 96 or 384 wellhead, as well as a span 8 pod. You can have two multi-channels, a multi-channel and a span, and the option of those. And the deck is highly configurable. It offers a larger deck than the NX or the Biomech 4000 with approximately 20 deck positions. The example NGS deck layout that we have below includes the uh, integrated T-Robot, which is our integrated thermocycler on the left. There's a wash station um, in the back row on the left, which allows for reuse of tips after transfers, an orbital shaker, and then also a uh, static LTA device to keep reagents chilled as well. Okay, continuing on to scoping options and things that are considered when, when developing a method, we have options for labware selection, heating and cooling, orbital shaking and tip mixing, and tip utilization. So labware selection could be tubes versus plates. What's the right labware for your application? It could be based on sample number, dead volume in the tube, um, what capacity you need for your sample. We have options for reagent reservoirs. Uh, whether it's a full plate reservoir, we have modular reservoirs as, as shown in the center picture below, which can hold different volumes of reagents based on um, the amount needed for each application. The right modular reservoir is, is matched to the volume to reduce dead volume. There's uh, necessary magnetic plates for bead separation, with the example picture on the bottom left there, 
And then thermocycler lids might be another labware option that's uh, needed with integrated thermocycling on your deck. There's consideration for pit mixing versus shaking. Uh, orbital shaking delivers fast, efficient plate mixing. It reduces tip usage and provides uniform results. Whereas tip mixing works well for larger volumes. It prevents cross-contamination with labware that's at or near well capacity. So if you have a well that's uh, almost full, orbital shaking isn't the right option for that particular mix step. So tip mixing will be deployed um, for those purposes. And tip mixing can also access tubes or labware that are not compatible with orbital deck. Uh, orbital, with an orbital shaker deck, like a 6x4 aluminum tube rack, um, a heavy aluminum tube rack that will not fit on our orbital shaker. Heating and cooling options. Uh, Peltier units are, are easy to use. They, they heat and cool. There's various adapters that can be fit onto the surface of the Peltier to accommodate various labware, so round bottom wells, uh, flat bottom, PCR adapters, etc. There's open, it's an open position, so there's no plate sealing, so considerations have to be made for uh, higher temperatures and evaporation. There's a slower uh, ramping and cooling speed than thermocyclers have, and it's not, all, not ideal for all applications, such as high temperatures because of evaporation issues. Thermocycling can be integrated. Uh, it can be integrated on all of our platforms, BIMEC 4000, NXT, or FXT, and the thermocyclers provide a true walk-away solution, not having to um, interact with your, uh, with a method for every incubation that you need to perform. And if you're familiar with some of the longer applications, there's multiple incubations that take place, which, re which would require multiple user interventions for off-deck thermocycling. So this allows the, the instrument to move the plate automatically to the thermocycler and, and continue the method without any user intervention. Uh, the Plate sealing lids prevent evaporation, and then <clears throat> the T-robots are compatible with commonly used PCR labware. And we continue to do development work to integrate additional manufacturers' uh, thermocycling components as well. So tip selection. Choosing the tip type is important, depending on the type of reagent you're transferring to, uh, the type of labware you're trying to access. So our tips come in various volume ranges from uh, 20 microliters up to 1,000 microliters. There's sterile barrier or non-barrier options, and then we also have conductive and non-conductive tips, which are used for liquid level sensing. So tube access is uh, an important part of the selection. A P20 tip is shorter. It has a higher volume without the barrier than, than 20 microliters. And this might be the right option for a shallow microtether plate, whereas a P50 is a longer tip, it's more slender, and it would work more effectively with the default plate. So after the labware and the deck layout and all the accessories and, and active devices are selected for the application, we then start looking at method workflow options. So if you're familiar with our methods, you're, you're familiar with the user interface that we have um, at the start of the run. If you're not familiar with our methods, all of our methods have a user interface. And so what the user interface does is, is provide all the option settings that are relevant to the specific application. It's going to have things such as options for on or off deck thermocycling, options for training mode, which allows you to quickly run through a method without the lengthy incubations that can be used for training, or <clears throat> optimization and, and testing in your laboratory. It includes options for all relevant application specific options. That could be, um, in this case, in the example for the SWIFT biosciences method, there's sample input options and fragment size options, as well as which part of the method that you're wishing to run. So in this case, the PCR-free portion of the method has been selected with various uh, index adapter transfer options. All the options are validated for proper selection um, to ensure that that correct inputs are made by the user and will not generate errors upon execution of the run. And then there's also safe stopping points built in to these options to allow safe stopping points matching the manufacturer's protocol, uh, ability to safely store your samples at breakpoints, uh, separate um, <clears throat> safe stopping points for pre and post PCR, 
um, being able to stop the method and then transfer your samples to a different instrument if that happens to be um, the way that your lab's um, quality management system dictates. It allows for off-deck incubations and safe stop points allow for recovery by being able to perform portions of the method or go back in the workflow to a previous point <clears throat> and continue from there. And lastly, other considerations that we have in the deck for chemistry specific um, issues, there can be multiple issues, but some examples that we have here are uh, considerations for sodium hydroxide. So certain reactions are dependent on the sodium hydroxide to be prepared fresh. So uh, we have built-in considerations for that, where prompts are, are presented to the user at, at the right time in the method to present the deck with that particular reagent. For ethanol, we have considerations over evaporation and uh, water adhesion to the, to the ethanol. So we want to ensure that the, uh, the dead volume is correct for ethanol, depending on the length of the run. Walk away is great, but if you have ethanol on your deck for an entire day, then we definitely have to have considerations for those types of reagents. So after all those considerations are made and, and scoping is, is set out, we begin our development and optimization process. So template methods are written to follow the manufacturer's protocol, and then we hit the lab. We have a facility here in Indianapolis with multiple instruments on all, our, all of our platforms. We use live chemistry, and uh, we're, the ultimate goal is to generate data with the kits that customers are actually going to use. So to start, we do thorough dry testing and logistical movement testing. We make sure that the method structure is sound, that lab is moving where it's supposed to be, um, pipetting is occurring in the well at the right depth, whether it's from the bottom or from the top of the plate. <clears throat> when that all checks out, we move into light reagent testing. And what that is, is using um, ethanol or uh, glycerol solutions to mimic enzyme transfers. Uh, we are the manufacturer of our B chemistry that you see in all the NGS kits, so we have the ability to test uh, B dispensing and accuracy of, of the B ratios in-house with our, with our own chemistry. So we use real chemistry when possible during the light reagent testing and optimization. And then we go into optimizing and calibrating pipetting specific to each application or specific transfer. So again, with, with uh, bead cleanups, uh, size selection, volume transfers and ratios are critical. Same for any type of reaction setup. The balance of the chemistry is, is critical to the optimal performance of the, of the application. So each of our pipetting techniques can be dialed in to very accurate, uh, accurate volume transfers across the range of the pipette tip. So we, we spend time to make sure that that's set up as accurately as possible to generate the most robust results. Following the optimization, we move into our live chemistry testing. So we've, we've ensured that the method is sound, our pipetting optimization is up to spec, and then we actually run real kits with real chemistry with real samples. Um, if needed, after data is generated, we, we continue to do optimization that we sometimes don't see until we use the actual chemistry and we continue to fine-tune the method until we have the results that we're looking for. So we determine those results based on generation of quantitative and qualitative data, such as bioanalyzer tracing, qPCR data, uh, and then downstream into the sequencing data and sequencing metrics. So the next part of our process is content generation and review. And I'm going to hand off to my colleague, Zach Smith, and he's going to continue with our development process from this point forward. Okay. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us for this long. Uh, David's done a pretty good job so far. And I'm hoping to pick up where he's left off. Um, so content generation and review process. So that's where we generate the technical and application notes to demonstrate the method capabilities and the robustness of our application. Um, the first thing we'll do is we will have the uh, chemistry vendor go through our, our data, either our QC traces from the bioanalyzer, uh, qPCR results, or our sequencing metrics, and review those and make sure that the chemistry vendor is, is content with the results. 
Um, as David said, we have a, a facility here in Indianapolis that is, is fully equipped for this work. We uh, have two sequencers in-house, uh, an aluminum MySeq and an XSeq 500, uh, that we can use to generate the sequencing data we need. Um, if we need uh, more data, well, we have worked on a couple of projects that require high-seq data. Uh, we can certainly work with the, uh, the vendors or we send those out for additional data analysis. Um, and then we work, we'll work with the bioinformatics groups associated with the, uh, the reagent vendors to, uh, to analyze those data and interpret them properly. Um, the data must meet acceptable yields, yields for metrics, or metrics for yield, uh, the sizing must be accurate, and the sequencing metrics such as the percent you know, rRNA contamination if you're working with, a, with an RNA method, or the percent on target uh, for the you know, percent on target read for a capture method uh, must be consistent with what the uh, reagent vendor is seeing in the manual prep. Uh, the other thing we look for is evidence of cross-contamination. So our NGS methods are working with all of the plates typically, uh, which helps speed the workflow along because then you're not having to seal and unseal plates. Uh, but we do realize that the a possibility that, I mean, this represents a risk for cross-contamination. So it's something we're looking for uh, in the sequencing data, and um, it is something that you, because we're looking for it in sequencing data, you can see levels that are not detectable on um, bioanalyzer or other fragment analysis traces, and so we feel like we really do go one step beyond uh, what's typical in proving that our automation solutions are sound and they're the data that you, you can trust the data that's being generated. Um, so once that review process is done, then we will generate uh, content for public distribution, like this webinar that you've all kindly decided to uh, show up for. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, application installation. So we realized that while we have deck, you know, we have instrument configurations that we uh, that we uh, generally suggest for NGS applications, that our customers are working with so much more because our our liquid handlers really are application agnostic and they're, they're chemistry agnostic. Um, and so you might be doing NGS applications, you might be doing some cellular or protein work, and so we don't force a customer to buy a specific configuration um, for their instrument. So we recognize that the instrument, that the applications therefore that we develop need to be flexible in their design and that they can be configured properly. So uh, during the course of application installation, uh, our field application specialist will go through and they will uh, implement the method on your instrument and they will perform uh, a whole range of on-site pipetting optimizations and on-site testing, frequently going through uh, a, uh, a uh, logistical test to make sure the lab is moving properly, that your stack offsets are correct, um, and then they'll go through some pipetting testing and actually go through a complete water run, uh, typically while they're at a customer site, so that you can verify that the pipetting is uh, on target. Um, and then after the application is installed, uh, we have an entire group that provides tech support for these applications and uh, other groups that provide service support uh, for the hardware. And then we have another third group that provides training and host user group meetings for our customers. Um, so the reason why we do this is we, it's not like we're just going to go through and airdrop in an application into your site and expect you to just know how to use it. We do uh, backstop our applications with a very extensive uh, group of people that do uh, various varieties of support for our customers. So um, there's some other uh, additional software features beyond Biomex software that I, I wanted to touch on during the course of this presentation. Um, both of which are fairly new, Biomech Method Launcher being the newest. Um, but these are software packages that we have developed because we feel like um, we can have, offer an improved user experience and better data management and handling during the course of the method being run. So, you know, you, 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 during the course of the average day, you'll come to your Biomech and you'll say, I want to run a method. All right, well, are we sure we picked the right project? and am I working with the most recent version of my method? Or usually what we find out is our normal biomech method or methods and biomech operators on vacation and the PI wants me to run an assay and I really need some help with this. So for those reasons and several others, oh, and by the way, this is what our, our standard user interface looks like. So if you were to open up this, you know, this the editor uh, on your controller, this is what you would see. 
Um, it's fairly straightforward to use uh, as far as programming is concerned. The UI gives you uh, a GUI based interface for building methods and, and, build, and building out software solutions if you want to do that. Alternatively, you can use Biomic Method Launcher to launch your application that's been installed already. So Biomic Method Launcher is a, is a new product. Uh, it has two components to it. One is the launcher interface, which you're seeing here. And the other one is guided labware setup. Those are the, primary, you know, the two primary components here. So the launcher allows you to interact with your instrument without actually running the editor software. So you would just go in and begin Biomic Method Launcher. And your applications would be listed out there on the launcher, and there would be icons that allow you to select the right one. Um, you can also you know, perform manual control on the instrument uh, through the launcher as well, just by clicking down on the uh, manual control tab, and it will bring up a whole variety of options that you can use to run the instrument. Once you've selected your method, uh, say for example you want to run uh, Illumina TrueSight HLA version 2, um, an HTML-based user interface would pop up and it would give you uh, the options you need to run the method, how many samples you want to process, and which components of the method that you want to run. Um, we, you know, we build these UIs in such a way that they're easy to operate and should be fairly straightforward uh, for any operator to employ. The other component uh, of Biomet Method Launcher is uh, a new step called Guided Labware Setup. So Guided Labware Setup will step you through on a, on a plate by plate, tip box by tip box um, uh, process to set the deck up uh, in such a way that you know, it is properly set up. And one of the things it really does nicely is that it will go through and will show you uh, side views of stacks of labware, so you can see that on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and for reagents that are deployed in troughs or you have uh, you know, master mixes that you need to create, all those setup instructions are included in the individual labware descriptions. Um, additionally, you can print off the, the guide library setup as a PDF and you can take those set of instructions to back to your bench where you can go and make up your master mixes. Um, the other thing you can do is you can, um, and the other thing you can do with those PDFs is the PDFs can be uploaded to uh, a limb system, for example, or copied into a lab notebook to show, you know, the user, this is what I've done on this particular day. Um, it's a really uh, powerful uh, interface and I like it quite a lot actually. So once you get beyond guided labware setup, then during the course of the method running, this is what the what the runtime or what the runtime interface would look like for Biomech Method Launcher. Uh, so on the left, you'll see uh, one the, the uh, method screen where it will go through and will give you a, a progress bar on the top that will show you how long you know how long the method is going to continue. So this answers the vital question of can I go and get a cup of coffee or do I have time to go to the bathroom or is it time to interact with the instrument? And then it will go through and will offer you a series of milestones to let you know what process it's working on and how long that individual process is going to take. Um, if you flip over to the method view over here on the uh, right hand side of your screen, um, it will actually go through and show you the biomet steps that it's actually looking through. And if you go into the labware dialog, which is on the right, bottom right of each of those, um, each of those uh, screens, you can actually click and view the volumes on every individual piece of labware as the method is progressing, so you can monitor it's, uh, it's running in real time. Ah, uh, yes, data handling. So, automation methods can generate a large number of data that will need to be tracked. Um, just for this, and just one well, for example, of this one plate, uh, we could you know, track what the sample ID is, what the project ID is, what the PI is we're working for um, on this particular project, what species it is, the, the name of the technician running the assay, concentrations, volumes, the list goes on and on. And the issue gets exponentially worse the more plates you process. It leads to a lot of data that needs to be handled. And of course, it's not just from, you know, this data is piling up during the course of numerous applications. So you're, you're, if you're starting off with NGS samples, either DNA or RNA, you'll want to know, you know, where those samples were accessioned from, uh, any data that's associated with them, including species or the volume or the concentration, or maybe you'll have to quantify them yourself when you get them in. in. And so one of the things you can do is you can merge the detector data and then track the data and the sample ID so the dilution plate as you quantify and normalize the DNA. Then there's the matter of doing your NGS library prep. And so at that point, you'll want to track 
what samples are associated with what indices so that you can demultiplex samples later. And then you'll want to export some of that data into the Illumina Experiment Manager for your sample sheet. Uh, and then also extend that data to the lens, you know, a lens system if your lab has one for downstream analysis. So DART 2.0 stands for uh, Data Acquisition and Reporting Tool. Is a Biomag data or is a software package that works with Biomag and SQL to generate a repository that will track all of that information on a per plate basis. So it can take reader data, it will take data from data sets that are generated as a part of normal operation from Biomag software, and it can report them out to uh, end other devices, a lib system, uh, any web enabled device so allowing you to monitor the run in real time, or uh, other terminals inside or outside the lab if you have it configured right. So there's a huge number of ways, there's several ways you can uh, access the data with uh, Dart. So you can create, have you know, the Dart software create lab reports that will automatically just explore into, uh, say, Excel sheets. And then the report contains an embedded link to the database. So you can just click refresh on your Excel sheet and then it will automatically repopulate that sheet with the fresh data from the report if you ran another assay, for example. So that's really convenient. Um, the other thing you can do is you can monitor runs in real time using the web enabled or using the web interface. So Dart will report out if the method is running, how long it's been running. Uh, you can query all the various sorts of labware um, and find out what's been done and who's, who's been doing the run. And you can use it to generate all kinds of reports. So on the top left, we've got the um, what the query builder looks like, and you can include any. Uh, if you're basically, if you're building a report out, uh, it's basically just a matter of clicking which fields you want to include in the report. And so above, for example, I've got um, an illustration where you're using Dart to report uh, data out to the Illumina Experiment Manager for your sample sheet generation, including the sample and which I5 and I7 indices have been associated with which library. And on the left, on the bottom there, we have you know a library normalization report from Dart 2.0 where we're going through and we're uh, showing what the starting concentration was, how much volume was moved, and what the normalization concentration was afterwards. So it allows you a variety of ways of getting access to your data and, and storing it. So, <clears throat> so finally, I wanted to and, uh, just go over some of our you know, our application cards. So we've got. Uh, website with a link you can see above, uh, info.beckmanculture.com slash NGS, and there you'll find our, our current NGS library preparation method card. So this method card will detail what methods we've, we've, we've uh, developed or what applications we've developed on which platforms. Um, there's this process, this list is continually growing, um, and uh, we're actively adding uh, content to it on a, on a week, well, it seems like on a daily basis these days. Um, so I would strongly encourage any, any and all of you to, to uh, go ahead and zip over to this website and uh, for more information. So finally, um, I just wanted to invite uh, anyone to uh, send us questions via the Q&A tab. And uh, thank you for attending. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, David and Zach, for your presentations. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. David and Zach will answer as many questions as time permits. The first question is, how long does it take to implement an existing method with no modifications versus one with modifications? Hi, uh, hello everybody, this is David. Um, so it depends on the protocol. Typically, uh, we can give an estimate of about two days for a protocol that would take about a day to process manually, and then extending the, the length of implementation for protocols that are longer than that. So if you're, if you're looking at capture protocols, that might be a, a two or three day manual protocol, then we typically need about a day to come into the lab and, and get the hardware configured, make sure all the checks and balances are taken care of, and then um, 
approximately the time of the manual prep to um, go through the protocol and the automation with water testing and then potentially some portion of a live run to ensure that everything is, is working, maybe generate some data with the customer prior to the, the application scientist leaving. <coughs> um, as far as custom modifications, that all depends on what the customer um, is going to need as compared to our template method. But typically it will add uh, an extra day for a shorter protocol or possibly two days for one of the longer capture protocols, for example, to uh, implement those changes at the customer site. Ideally, those modifications or changes are addressed prior to the application scientist visit. So a lot of those can be dealt with prior to the visit to help um, speed up the time um, when the application scientist is actually on site. Do you, do you have, uh, do you ever have testing for nimble gene capture protocol on those sample prep machines? Uh, I don't actually know the answer to that question off the top of my head. Um, if you wouldn't mind emailing that question to us, uh, we can provide you with the contact information. We have your information now and we'll get back to you and um, follow up with a response. How much um, of the work day is needed for 12 samples? How much of the work day is needed for 12 samples? Is there a particular uh, application in mind. Is that for the Nimble Gene Protocol? The person did not specify, but I believe it is the person that asked about Nimble Gene, yes. So let's assume. Okay, yeah, again, I'm not exactly familiar with that protocol, so um, we can follow up with that second part of the question as well. How do I get support for developing methods not on your list? Okay, so our um, methods that are not on our list are, can always be developed. A lot of times your need is, is similar in nature to a protocol that we already have developed and the modifications from one of the methods on our list is not that far off from um, what your needs are. So uh, typically we work through our field applications team and you could reach out to your local sales rep who could put you in contact with the region specific um, individual for handling application development in your area. How often do you add methods to your menu? Uh, the, the template methods um, are developed on an ongoing basis. Uh, typically, it, it's, uh, the queue is prioritized based on current field demand, customer demand for specific applications. And currently, we're putting effort into developing these applications on some of our, our smaller platforms, so the B4K, Biomech 4000, and the Biomech NX platforms. Um, for the most part, we've been focusing on the larger, higher throughput system, the FX dual pod, um, but you're going to start to see a lot of these applications rolling out uh, for the smaller Biomech 4000 and NX platforms. What's the pipe hitting volume range for your system? Um, we do have a technical spec document which we can provide a um, link to if anybody has a specific request for that. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head what the, the exact manufacturing specs are, although for um, most of the NGS methods, we're pipetting volumes down to about two microliters for certain enzymes or adapter transfers, and our systems are, are more than capable of handling that volume range with um, either our P20 or, or P50 tips. And that, that will work on all syringe sizes. So if you're familiar with our uh, span 8 systems, we have 250 microliter up to 1,000 microliter syringes. And those, uh, that volume, 2 microliters, is, is capable of being delivered accurately with any of those syringe uh, size ranges. Oh, and then just a quick point of clarification on the nipple gen question from earlier. Um, we have run the NibbleGen methods on our Biomech FXP platform, our largest platform, and those were developed in collaboration with specific customers. Um, and as far as the question about um, how long um, does it take to do 12 samples or any number of samples, that really depends on the individual method being run on a specific instrument. Great. So let's pause for a moment, um, see if more questions come in for us to answer. And we will go from there.
how much work time is needed for let's see how much work time is needed for 12 samples in library prep using BD auto machine uh, I guess I would need clarification on the, the BD auto auto machines mm. Okay. Is that maybe it was back in DC, back in Coulter? Um, you know what? It's it says using BD. I, I'm I really the person was not more specific than that. I'm sorry if if um. That's okay. I'll, I'll that answer with the assumption like, that they meant uh, uh, Biomech, uh, back in Coulter, Biomech uh, Automation. So, uh, twelve sample library prep. It really depends on the protocol. So, uh, there's protocols that are day long and our so for a day long protocol manually our systems can handle anywhere typically from 1 to 96 samples and the automation is capable of uh, processing 96 samples in approximately the same amount of time as a smaller number of samples of course with any method you're going to add time when you increase the sample number but um, Generally, automation is going to be able to accomplish that much more effectively than if you were to do it by hand. So if you, if you think through what a manual protocol would take for approximately uh, 12 samples, it tends to take approximately the same amount of time on the automation or faster. Um, what you're gaining there is the efficiency, the reproducibility of being able to walk away from that process. Now, if you look at an increased throughput of 96 samples, our automated systems can handle that throughput as well in approximately the same amount of time. Great. Uh, while we're waiting for additional questions to come in, I would once again like to thank David Harvath and Zach Smith for their presentation. Do you have any final comments? I'm sorry, did you use that for me? Yes, please. If you have any <laughs> any closing thoughts you'd like to share with us, please do. Right. So I uh, just uh, just mentioned that the uh, the next webinar in the series is going to prepare uh, provide I'm sorry details like throughput for some specific method examples. So today's webinar was discussing more of our overall application development process, um, things that we consider when we're developing applications for a customer, and. You know, discussing the, the data management capabilities of the DART system and our new Biomech method launcher features. So the next webinar, and actually the, the third one as well, are going to focus more on specific applications. So um, keep a lookout for those and you'll be able to um, hopefully have an application in that webinar that uh, your lab's interested in. There's a lot more specifics about how we accomplish uh, generating uh, NGS sample prep with those specific applications. Well, thank you. And I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, Beckman Culture Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. As a reminder, this webinar is the first in a three-part series. Part two, DNA and RNA sequencing sample prep, automating simple to complex methods, is available on demand on the LabRoots website. Please save the date for part three, Mission Possible, automating NGS sample prep for challenging samples and niche applications, which will be presented on July 28th. Registration is now open for part three, so feel free to visit the LabRoots website to confirm your attendance today. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credit. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credit. This webcast can be viewed on demand through January 13, 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.